Greek mythology is a vast and intricate system of myths and legends that originated in ancient Greece. It encompasses a wide array of stories about gods, goddesses, heroes, monsters, and other mythical beings. Mythical narration plays an important role in nearly every genre of Greek literature. Nevertheless, the only general mythographical handbook to survive from Greek antiquity was the Library of Pseudo-Apollodorus. This work is highlighted as the primary surviving mythographical handbook from ancient Greece. It aims to harmonize the conflicting narratives found in Greek poetry and provides a comprehensive overview of Greek mythology and heroic legends. Though attributed to Apollodorus of Athens, it discusses events that occurred long after his lifetime, hence the term Pseudo-Apollodorus. The myth of Prometheus, famously depicted by Hesiod, serves as the basis for a tragic trilogy of plays, possibly by Aeschylus, including Prometheus Bound, Prometheus Unbound, and Prometheus Perforos. Prometheus's story involves his theft of fire from the gods to benefit humanity, leading to his punishment by Zeus. Homer is one of the most famous legendary poets in Greek mythology. According to tradition, Homer was a blind poet who lived in the 8th century BC, although his exact identity and the historical accuracy of his existence remain subjects of scholarly debate. Some scholars argue that Homer may have been a real historical figure, while others believe that the poems attributed to him were the collective work of multiple poets and oral traditions. Homer's works were transmitted orally for centuries before being written down, and they continue to be studied and revered for their rich storytelling. Homer's epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are among the earliest literary sources of Greek mythology. These epics form the cornerstone of Greek literature, detailing the events of the Trojan War and the journey of Odysseus. The epic cycle, which includes other poems related to the Trojan War, has mostly been lost to time. Despite their traditional attribution to Homer, the Homeric hymns are likely not directly connected to him. These choral hymns, dating from the early part of the Lyric Age, celebrate various gods and goddesses in a poetic form. Hesiod, a contemporary of Homer, provides significant contributions to Greek mythology through his works. Theogony offers a detailed account of the creation of the world, the origins of the gods, titans, and giants, along with extensive genealogies and folktales. Works and Days is a didactic poem that combines practical advice for farming life with myths such as those of Prometheus, Pandora, and the Five Ages. Hesiod's writings offer insights into the challenges of existence in a world fraught with danger, both natural and divine. Greek mythology played a central role in classical Athenian drama, particularly in tragic plays by playwrights like Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. These playwrights often drew their plots from myths of the Age of Heroes and the Trojan War. Tragic stories such as those of Agamemnon and his children, Oedipus, Jason, and Medea took on their classic form in these tragedies. Even comic playwrights like Aristophanes utilized myths in works like The Birds and the Frogs. Historians such as Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus, as well as geographers like Pausanias and Strabo, documented various myths and legends they encountered during their travels throughout the Greek world. They often provided alternative versions of myths and sought to reconcile differing cultural concepts. Herodotus, in particular, explored the historical and mythological roots of the confrontation between Greece and the East. The poetry of the Hellenistic and Roman ages, while primarily composed as a literary exercise, contains numerous important details about Greek mythology. Roman poets such as Ovid, Statius, Valerius Flaccus, Seneca, and Virgil, along with Greek poets like Nonus, Antoninus Liberalis, and Quintus Smyrnaeus, contributed significantly to the mythological corpus. They often reinterpreted traditional myths and infused them with new meanings. Prose writers from the same periods, including Apuleius, Petronius, Lollianus, and Heliodorus, also made references to myths in their works. Important non-poetical sources include the Fabuli and Astronomica of the Roman writer known as Pseudohygienus, the Imagines of Philostratus the Elder and Philostratus the Younger and the descriptions of Callistratus. Several Byzantine Greek writers, such as Arnobius, Hesychius, the author of the Suda, John Setsus, and Eustathius, continued to preserve and interpret Greek mythology from a Christian moralizing perspective. 
They drew upon earlier Greek works that are now lost, providing valuable insights into the mythological traditions of antiquity. The discoveries of the Mycenaean and Minoan civilizations in the 19th and 20th centuries respectively marked significant milestones in the study of Greek mythology and history. Heinrich Schliemann's excavation of Mycenaean sites and Arthur Evans' exploration of Minoan Crete not only unearthed tangible evidence of ancient civilizations but also shed light on many aspects of Greek mythological narratives. The archaeological findings provided by Schliemann and Evans helped elucidate numerous questions surrounding Homer's epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. These discoveries offer tangible evidence for many mythological details concerning gods, heroes, and ancient rituals. While the Linear B script, an ancient form of Greek found in both Mycenaean and Minoan contexts, mainly recorded inventories, it also provided tantalizing hints about the religious and mythological beliefs of these civilizations. Though the script primarily dealt with practical matters, certain names of gods and heroes have been tentatively identified within its inscriptions. A crucial aspect of the archaeological evidence comes from the geometric designs found on pottery dating back to the 8th century BC. These designs often depict scenes from the Trojan Cycle and the adventures of Heracles, among others. Such visual representations of myths are significant for two main reasons. Firstly, many Greek myths are depicted on these vases earlier than they appear in literary sources. For instance, only the Cerberus adventure of Heracles is found in contemporary literary texts, while the other labors are first attested on these visual artifacts. Secondly, these visual sources sometimes portray myths or mythical scenes that have not been found in any extant literary source. In some instances, the first known representation of a myth in geometric art predates its first known representation in late archaic poetry by several centuries. Throughout the archaic, classical, and Hellenistic periods, depictions of Homeric and various other mythological scenes became increasingly prevalent, supplementing the existing literary evidence. These visual representations not only provided additional insights into the myths themselves, but also offered glimpses into the artistic and cultural contexts in which they were created. The creation myth recounted by Hesiod in his work Theogony offers a profound and vivid explanation for the origins of the universe and its divine inhabitants. Hesiod begins his narrative with chaos, a primordial void from which all things emerged. From chaos came Gaia, the earth described as the ever-sure foundation of all, symbolizing stability and fertility. Following Gaia's emergence, Tartarus, the abyss beneath the earth, and Eros, the god of love, also came into existence, representing the forces of darkness and passion, respectively. Gaia, without the assistance of a male partner, gave birth to Uranus, the sky, who then fertilized her. From this union sprung the Titans, a powerful race of deities, who would play significant roles in the unfolding drama of Greek mythology. The Titans were divided into six males, Coeus, Crius, Cronus, Hyperion, Iapetus, and Oceanus, and six females, Nemosyne, Phoebe, Rhea, Thea, Themis, and Tethys. However, Uranus and Gaia, fearing the power of their offspring, decreed that no more Titans were to be born. This decree led to strife and resentment, particularly from Gaia who felt betrayed by Uranus's actions. Uranus further incited Gaia's anger by banishing the one-eyed Cyclopes and the hundred-handed ones, the offspring of Gaia and Uranus, to Tartarus. Gaia, enraged by Uranus's cruelty, turned to her youngest son, Cronus, described as the wily, youngest and most terrible of Gaia's children. She convinced Cronus to take drastic action against his father. With Gaia's guidance, Cronus castrated Uranus, seizing power and becoming the ruler of the Titans. Cronus then took his sister Rhea as his consort, and together they ruled over the Titans, with the other siblings serving as their court. Upon learning of the prophecy that one of his offspring would overthrow him, Cronus, consumed by fear and paranoia, resorted to extreme measures to maintain his rule. Each time his wife Rhea gave birth, Cronus, driven by his dread of rebellion, devoured the newborn child. Rhea, anguished by her husband's actions, devised a plan to save her youngest son, Zeus. She concealed Zeus on the island of Crete and presented Cronus with a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes, which he unwittingly swallowed. Zeus was entrusted to the care of the nymphs, 
Adamanthia, and Melissa, as well as the goat Amathea, who nursed him with her milk. Under the protection of these guardians, Zeus grew in secret, hidden away from his father's reach. As Zeus matured into adulthood, he became determined to overthrow his father and claim his rightful place as the ruler of the gods. With cunning and strategy, Zeus devised a plan to force Cronus to relinquish his power. He prepared a potion that induced vomiting and tricked Cronus into consuming it. As Cronus regurgitated the contents of his stomach, Zeus emerged unscathed, along with his siblings, Poseidon, Hades, Hestia, Demeter, and Hera, who had been swallowed by Cronus years earlier. With his brothers and sisters by his side, Zeus challenged Cronus to a titanic struggle for supremacy. The ensuing conflict, known as the Titanomachy, was a cataclysmic clash between the Olympian gods and the Titans, with Zeus leading the charge. In a decisive battle, Zeus and his allies, including the freed Cyclopes, emerged victorious over Cronus and the Titans. Defeated and overthrown, Cronus and his fellow Titans were cast down into the depths of Tartarus, the darkest abyss of the underworld, where they faced eternal imprisonment and torment. Upon receiving a prophecy that the offspring of his first wife, Metis, would give birth to a god greater than himself, Zeus, plagued by concerns of usurpation, resorted to drastic measures. In an attempt to thwart fate, Zeus swallowed Metis whole. However, unbeknownst to him, Metis was already pregnant with Athena, the goddess of wisdom and warfare. As time passed, Athena began to grow within Zeus, until finally, she burst forth from his head fully grown and clad in armor, a remarkable and awe-inspiring sight. This miraculous birth established Athena as one of the most formidable and revered deities among the Greek pantheon. Theogonies, which recount the genealogy and origins of the gods, were considered the prototypical poetic genre, imbued with almost magical powers. Poets such as Orpheus were regarded as the archetypal singers of Theogonies, using their poetic prowess to invoke divine favor and influence natural phenomena. Hesiod's Theogony is highlighted as the fullest surviving account of the gods and the poet's function in ancient Greek society. It includes a lengthy invocation to the muses, emphasizing the divine inspiration behind the poetic composition. Additionally, it's important to mention lost poems attributed to legendary seers like Orpheus, Museus, and Epimenides, which were utilized in private ritual purifications and mystery rites, hinting at the esoteric and mystical aspects of Greek religious practices. The influence of Theogonies extended even to philosophical circles, as indicated by references in the works of Plato. However, due to the secretive nature of religious rites and beliefs, much of this knowledge was restricted to initiates and practitioners, with only allusions and remnants of these traditions surviving in later literature and cultural practices. While many of these works have been lost to time, fragments survive in quotations by Neoplatonist philosophers and recently unearthed papyrus scraps, such as the Dervini papyrus. This particular fragment, dating back to the 5th century BC, provides evidence of a theogonic cosmogonic poem attributed to Orpheus, showcasing the enduring presence of mythical themes in ancient Greek culture. The early philosophical cosmologists, in their exploration of the natural world and the universe, often engaged with and responded to these popular mythical conceptions. They either reacted against them or built upon them, incorporating elements of traditional mythology into their philosophical frameworks. Homer and Hesiod, with their epic poems, provided rich sources of mythical imagery and cosmological ideas. In Homer's worldview, the earth was depicted as a flat disk floating on the river Oceanus, surrounded by a hemispherical sky adorned with celestial bodies such as the sun, moon, and stars. The sun, personified as Helios, was envisioned as a charioteer who traversed the heavens during the day and sailed around the earth in a golden bowl at night. This cosmological model allowed for a rich tapestry of natural phenomena, with various elements of the environment, sun, earth, heaven, rivers, and winds, being invoked in prayers and called upon to witness oaths. Moreover, natural features such as fissures were often believed to be entrances to the subterranean realm of Hades, the god of the underworld, and his predecessors, serving as the abode of the dead. These mythical interpretations of the natural world and the afterlife provided a framework through which ancient Greeks understood and interacted with their environment. 
In addition to indigenous Greek mythological traditions, influences from other cultures also contributed to the development of new themes and ideas within Greek cosmology. The synthesis of various cultural influences resulted in a rich and multifaceted worldview that continued to evolve over time, shaping the philosophical and religious landscape of ancient Greece. Following the overthrow of the Titans, the Olympian gods and goddesses emerged as the principal deities of the Greek pantheon. While the notion of limiting their number to twelve seems to be a comparatively modern idea, the Olympians were revered as the supreme rulers of the cosmos, residing on Mount Olympus under the watchful eye of Zeus, the king of the gods. In addition to the Olympians, the Greeks worshipped a multitude of other divine beings, each associated with different aspects of the natural world. These included gods of the countryside, such as the satyr god Pan, as well as spirits like nymphs, associated with rivers, naiads, inhabiting springs, dryads, spirits of trees, and nereids, inhabiting the sea. River gods, satyrs, and various other entities also held significance in Greek religious beliefs. Furthermore, the Greek pantheon included dark powers, associated with the underworld, such as the Arrhenes, or Furies, who were believed to pursue and exact vengeance upon those guilty of crimes against blood relatives. These deities represented aspects of justice, retribution, and the consequences of moral transgressions. To honor the gods and goddesses of Greek mythology, poets composed the Homeric Hymns, a collection of 33 songs dedicated to individual deities. These hymns served as preludes to larger epics like the Theogony, each invoking the divine presence of a specific god or goddess. One defining characteristic of Greek anthropomorphism, according to scholar Walter Burkert, is that the Greek gods are depicted as persons rather than abstract concepts. Despite their essentially corporeal but ideal bodies, the gods possess extraordinary abilities and are not subject to the limitations of mortal existence. They are immune to disease and aging, and their immortality is maintained through the constant consumption of nectar and ambrosia, which rejuvenates their divine essence. Each god and goddess in Greek mythology possesses their own distinct genealogy, interests, expertise, and personality. These attributes are often depicted in various local variants of myths and legends, resulting in diverse descriptions and interpretations of the same deity. When invoked in poetry, prayer, or religious rituals, the gods are often addressed using a combination of their name and epithets, which serve to identify them by their unique qualities and functions. For example, Apollo Musagetes refers to Apollo as the leader of the Muses, emphasizing his association with music and the arts. Furthermore, most gods are associated with specific aspects of life or natural phenomena. For instance, Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty, Ares is the god of war, Hades is the ruler of the underworld, and Athena is the goddess of wisdom and courage. Some gods, like Apollo and Dionysus, exhibit complex personalities and multifaceted functions, while others, such as Hestia, goddess of the hearth, and Helios, personification of the sun, serve primarily as personifications of abstract concepts or natural elements. The worship of these gods was often centralized around impressive temples that were dedicated to a limited number of major deities, who were the focus of large panhellenic cults. However, individual regions and villages also established their own cults dedicated to minor gods, reflecting local traditions and beliefs. Additionally, many cities honored well-known gods with unique local rites and associated myths that were distinct from those found elsewhere in Greece. During the period of heroic age, the cult of heroes or demigods supplemented that of the gods, with legendary figures such as Heracles and Perseus receiving veneration alongside the Olympian deities. This multifaceted religious landscape reflects the rich tapestry of beliefs and practices that characterized ancient Greek society, where divine beings were revered and worshipped in various forms and contexts. In the early days of the world, gods and mortals coexisted more closely than they did in later ages. This transitional period is characterized by tales of interaction and intertwining between the divine and mortal realms, many of which are recounted in Ovid's Metamorphoses. These tales can be broadly categorized into two thematic groups, tales of love and tales of punishment. Stories of love often involve complex relationships between gods and mortals, frequently featuring themes of incest, seduction, 
or rape by male gods upon mortal women, resulting in the birth of heroic offspring. These narratives often caution against such relationships, portraying them as fraught with danger and leading to tragic consequences. Even in cases where consent is present, happy endings are rare, emphasizing the inherent difficulties and risks involved in relationships between gods and mortals. However, there are also instances where female divinities mate with mortal men, reversing the usual dynamic. One such example is found in the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, where the goddess Aphrodite lies with the mortal Anchises, resulting in the birth of Aeneas, the legendary founder of Rome. These tales serve to illustrate the complex interactions and blurred boundaries between the divine and mortal realms during this transitional period. They explore themes of desire, power dynamics, and the consequences of crossing boundaries between gods and humans. Ultimately, they provide insights into the evolving relationship between gods and mortals in Greek mythology, shedding light on the moral and ethical complexities inherent in their interactions. One prominent example is the myth of Prometheus, who defies the gods by stealing fire and giving it to humanity. This act of defiance not only grants humans the gift of fire, symbolizing knowledge and civilization, but also incurs the wrath of Zeus, leading to Prometheus's punishment, being chained to a rock where an eagle perpetually feasts on his liver. Similarly, Tantalus, a mortal king, dares to steal nectar and ambrosia from the gods' table and shares it with his subjects, revealing the secrets of the gods. As a result, Tantalus suffers eternal torment in the underworld, where he is condemned to stand in a pool of water beneath a fruit tree, forever unable to quench his thirst or satisfy his hunger. Other examples include the invention of sacrifice by Prometheus or Lycan, the introduction of agriculture and the mysteries by Demeter to Triptolemus, and the invention of the Aulos by Marcias, leading to a fateful musical contest with Apollo. These myths underscore the tension between mortals and gods, as well as the consequences of overstepping divine boundaries or challenging divine authority. They also serve as cautionary tales, warning against hubris and the presumption of moral superiority over the gods. One vivid example of divine punishment is depicted in an anonymous papyrus fragment dating to the 3rd century, which portrays Dionysus's punishment of the king of Thrace, Lycurgus. Lycurgus's failure to recognize and honor the new god leads to horrific penalties that extend into the afterlife, highlighting the severe consequences of divine displeasure. This story of divine punishment is further explored in Aeschylus's trilogy, where the arrival of Dionysus to establish his cult in Thrace becomes a central theme. According to the myth, King Lycurgus of Thrace was known for his arrogance and impiety. When Dionysus, accompanied by his band of followers, known as the Menads, arrived in Thrace to spread his worship and revelry. Lycurgus opposed him fiercely. The king saw Dionysus's cult as a threat to his own authority, and sought to banish or even kill the god. In his rage, Lycurgus attacked Dionysus's followers, the Menads, with violence and brutality, disrupting their ecstatic rituals and attempting to drive them away. In response, Dionysus unleashed his divine wrath upon Lycurgus punishing him for his hubris and sacrilege. The punishment inflicted upon Lycurgus by Dionysus varies in different versions of the myth. In some accounts, Dionysus drove Lycurgus mad, causing him to mistake his own son for a vine and kill him. In other versions, Dionysus blinded Lycurgus or caused him to be torn apart by wild animals. Similarly, in Euripides's The Bacchae, the king of Thebes, Pentheus, faces punishment from Dionysus for disrespecting the god and spying on his female worshippers, the Menads. These myths of punishment serve as reminders of the power and authority of the gods, as well as the importance of reverence and obedience in the mortal realm. They also reflect broader cultural attitudes toward morality, justice, and the relationship between mortals and the divine in ancient Greek society. The story based on an old folktale motif, continues the theme of divine interaction with mortals, particularly focusing on the goddess Demeter's search for her daughter, Persephone, and the consequences of mortal misunderstanding. In this tale, Demeter, disguised as an old woman named Doso, seeks refuge and hospitality from Celius, the king of Eleusis, in Attica. Touched by his kindness and hospitality, Demeter plans to reward Celius by making his son, 
Demophon, a god. However, the ritual is interrupted when Demophon's mother, Metanira, unexpectedly walks in and sees her son placed in the fire, causing her to scream in fright. This unforeseen interruption angers Demeter, who laments the lack of understanding among mortals regarding divine rituals and concepts. Demeter's frustration highlights the disconnect between the mortal and divine realms, as well as the consequences of mortal ignorance or misunderstanding in the presence of the gods. The story also emphasizes the importance of hospitality and reverence toward the divine, as Celius's hospitality towards Demeter initially earns him favor and divine blessings. However, the unintended consequences of Metanira's actions serve as a cautionary reminder of the need for reverence and respect in the presence of the divine. The Heroic Age, a significant period in Greek mythology, is characterized by the legendary deeds and exploits of heroes, whose stories are central to the cultural and religious landscape of ancient Greece. During this epoch, epic and genealogical poetry flourished, creating cycles of stories centered around particular heroes or events. These narratives established intricate family relationships between the heroes of different stories, organizing the tales into coherent sequences. As Ken Dowden notes, there is a saga effect, allowing audiences to follow the fates of specific families across successive generations. The rise of hero cults further solidified the importance of heroes within Greek society. Gods and heroes were revered together, invoked in oaths and prayers addressed to them. Walter Burkert observes that while the roster of gods remains fixed, heroes are continually added to the pantheon from the ranks of the deceased. This fluidity distinguishes hero cults from the cults of gods, with heroes often becoming the focal point of local group identity. Among the monumental events of the heroic age, the exploits of Heracles stand out as emblematic. His legendary feats, known as the labors of Heracles, mark the dawn of the age of heroes and exemplify the heroic ideal of strength, courage, and endurance. Additionally, three great events are ascribed to the heroic age, the Argonautic expedition, led by Jason in search of the Golden Fleece, the Theban Cycle, which includes the stories of Oedipus, Antigone, and the Seven Against Thebes, and the Trojan War, immortalized in Homer's epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Some scholars speculate that behind the elaborate mythology of Heracles, there may have been a real historical figure, perhaps a chieftain or nobleman associated with the kingdom of Argos. This theory suggests that over time, the exploits and accomplishments of this individual were embellished and mythologized, eventually leading to the creation of the legendary hero known as Heracles. Others propose allegorical interpretations of the Heracles myth, seeing it as a representation of the sun's yearly journey through the twelve constellations of the zodiac. This interpretation aligns with the motif of Heracles' twelve labors, each representing a different challenge or trial that he must overcome. Additionally, some scholars trace elements of Heracles' story to earlier myths from different cultures, suggesting that the Heracles myth may have been a local adaptation of hero myths that were already well established in various regions. Traditionally, Heracles is depicted as the son of Zeus, king of the gods, and Alcmene, granddaughter of the legendary hero Perseus. His legendary feats and adventures, often depicted in folktale themes, contributed to his popularity an enduring legacy in Greek mythology. Heracles is portrayed as a multifaceted figure, depicted not only as a mighty warrior and hero but also as a sacrificer and founder of altars. Despite his immense strength and courage, Heracles is also depicted as a flawed character, prone to fits of rage and impulsiveness, which ultimately lead to his tragic demise. In art and literature, Heracles is typically represented as a strong and muscular man of moderate height, wielding his characteristic weapons, the bow and the club. His legendary fight with the Nemean lion is a particularly popular motif in vase paintings, showcasing the unparalleled popularity and enduring legacy of Heracles in Greek culture. In Etruscan and Roman mythology and cult, Heracles held a significant place, with the exclamation Mercure becoming as familiar to the Romans as Heracles was to the Greeks. In Italy, he was revered as a god of merchants and traders, and many sought his favor for good luck or protection from danger. Heracles also enjoyed high social status through his association with the Dorian kings. 
His appointment as the official ancestor of the Dorian kings served as a legitimizing factor for the Dorian migrations into the Peloponnese region. Hillis, considered the eponymous hero of one Dorian Philae, was believed to be the son of Heracles, and his descendants, known as the Heraclids or Heraclidae, claimed descent from Heracles. The Heraclids, including figures like Macaria, Lamos, Manto, Biener, Tlepolemus, and Telephus, played a significant role in the conquest of Peloponnesian kingdoms such as Mycenae, Sparta, and Argos. Their rise to power, often referred to as the Dorian invasion, was mythologized as a right to rule these kingdoms based on their ancestry from Heracles. Other heroes from the earliest generations, such as Perseus, Deucalion, Theseus, and Bellerophon, share many traits with Heracles. Like him, they embark on solitary and fantastic adventures, facing and defeating formidable monsters like the Chimera and Medusa. Bellerophon's adventures, for example, mirror those of Heracles and Theseus, showcasing common themes of heroism, bravery, and triumph over adversity. Additionally, the theme of sending a hero on a perilous mission, often presumed to be fatal, recurs throughout this early heroic tradition, seen in the stories of Perseus and Bellerophon. This motif underscores the perilous nature of heroism and the sacrifices heroes are willing to make for the greater good. The Argonautica, attributed to the Hellenistic poet Apollonius of Rhodes, stands as the sole surviving Hellenistic epic and narrates the legendary voyage of Jason and the Argonauts in search of the Golden Fleece. This epic tale, steeped in myth and adventure, has captivated audiences for centuries with its themes of heroism, prophecy, and intrigue. The story begins with King Peleus, who receives a prophecy foretelling his downfall at the hands of a man with one sandal. When Jason, a young hero of great lineage, loses a sandal while crossing a river, he unwittingly fulfills this prophecy and sets in motion the events of the epic. Encouraged by Peleus to embark on a perilous quest to retrieve the Golden Fleece, Jason gathers a band of legendary heroes, including Heracles, Theseus, Atlanta, and Meleager, to join him aboard the ship Argo. The Argonauts journey to the distant land of Colchis, facing numerous trials and challenges along the way, including encounters with mythical creatures and treacherous seas. Their quest is fraught with danger and uncertainty, yet fueled by the promise of glory and riches. Despite its composition in the 3rd century BC by Apollonius of Rhodes, the story of the Argonauts predates even the Odyssey suggesting its enduring popularity and influence in ancient Greek culture. In ancient times, the expedition of the Argonauts was not merely a myth, but was regarded as a historical event, symbolizing the expansion of Greek commerce and colonization into the Black Sea region. The tale of the Argonauts also served as a fertile ground for local legends and adaptations, with various regions attaching their own myths and heroes to the epic cycle. One of the most captivating figures to emerge from the Argonautica is Medea, the sorceress and wife of Jason, whose story became a favorite subject for tragic poets, exploring themes of love, betrayal, and revenge. Between the legendary voyage of the Argo and the epical Trojan War, a generation of Greek mythology is characterized by its dark tales of horrific crimes and tragic destinies. Chief among these stories is the mythological saga of the House of Atreus, a dynasty steeped in betrayal, murder, and the ruthless pursuit of power. At the heart of the house of Atreus are the twins Atreus and Nyastis, whose bitter rivalry and thirst for power set in motion a series of events that would plunge the city of Mycenae into chaos and tragedy. Their descendants, including figures like Agamemnon and Menelaus, would become central players in the unfolding drama of the devolution of power in Mycenae. The Theban cycle, on the other hand, revolves around the city of Thebes and its legendary founder, Cadmus. The mythological narrative delves into the tumultuous reigns of kings like Laius and Oedipus, whose tragic fates and dark prophecies cast a shadow over the city. The tale culminates in the War of the Seven against Thebes, and the eventual downfall of the city at the hands of the Epigoni. Interestingly, early epic accounts of Oedipus, depict him continuing to rule at Thebes even after the revelation of his incestuous relationship with his mother, Jocasta. In these early versions, Oedipus marries a second wife, marking a departure from the tragic narrative immortalized in works like Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. The evolution of the Oedipus myth reflects the fluidity and complexity of Greek mythology, 
where stories are subject to reinterpretation and adaptation over time. Greek mythology reaches its zenith with the epic tale of the Trojan War, a conflict of legendary proportions fought between the mighty city-state of Troy and the united forces of Greece. The Trojan War, immortalized in Homer's epic poems, particularly the Iliad, serves as the pinnacle of ancient Greek literature and storytelling. In Homer's works, the narratives surrounding the Trojan War have been meticulously crafted, portraying the heroic deeds of warriors like Achilles, Hector, and Odysseus, as well as the tragic figures such as King Priam and his doomed sons. These epic poems provide a rich tapestry of human emotions, depicting themes of honor, glory, love, and loss against the backdrop of a monumental conflict. The Trojan War not only captured the imagination of the ancient Greeks but also resonated deeply within Roman culture. Virgil's Aeneid, a Latin epic poem, recounts the journey of Aeneas, a Trojan hero who escapes the fall of Troy and eventually founds the city of Rome. Aeneas' epic journey, as depicted in the Aeneid, symbolizes the connection between Troy and Rome, shaping the destiny of the Roman Empire. Book 2 of Virgil's Aeneid contains a poignant account of the sack of Troy, capturing the devastation and tragedy of the city's downfall. Through vivid imagery and powerful storytelling, Virgil immortalizes the heroic struggles and sacrifices of the Trojan people, paving the way for the birth of a new civilization in Italy. Additionally, pseudo-chronicles attributed to Dictys Cretensis and Dares Phrygius offer alternative accounts of the Trojan War in Latin literature. Although these works are considered fictional, they add another layer of intrigue and fascination to the enduring legend of Troy. The Trojan War cycle encompasses a series of epic poems that narrate the events leading up to, during, and after the legendary conflict between the Greeks and Trojans. It begins with the catalyst for the war, the golden apple of discord inscribed with for the fairest throne by Eris, leading to the judgment of Paris. Paris, a Trojan prince, is tasked with choosing the most beautiful among three goddesses, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite, ultimately awarding the apple to Aphrodite in exchange for the love of the most beautiful mortal woman, Helen. Helen, the wife of Menelaus, king of Sparta and brother of Agamemnon, is abducted by Paris, triggering the Greek expedition to retrieve her. Under the leadership of Agamemnon, the Greeks assemble a formidable army, including the renowned warrior Achilles. The Trojans, however, refuse to return Helen, leading to a protracted and brutal conflict that lasts for ten years. The Iliad, set in the tenth year of the war, focuses on the heated dispute between Agamemnon and Achilles, resulting in tragic consequences for both sides. Achilles' beloved companion Patroclus is killed in battle by Hector, the noble prince of Troy and eldest son of King Priam. Enraged by grief, Achilles seeks vengeance leading to a dramatic showdown between the two warriors. Hector is ultimately slain by Achilles, but not before Achilles himself falls victim to a fatal arrow shot by Paris, guided by Apollo. In a cunning scheme to breach the walls of Troy, the Greeks construct the infamous Trojan horse, a massive wooden structure concealing Greek soldiers within. Despite the warnings of Cassandra, Priam's prophetic daughter, and the efforts of the priest Laocoon to expose the ruse, the Trojans accept the horse as a gift to the goddess Athena. Under the cover of darkness, the Greek fleet returns, and the soldiers concealed within the horse emerge to open the gates of Troy, allowing the Greeks to sack the city. The aftermath of Troy's fall is marked by tragedy and devastation. Priam and his sons are slaughtered, and the surviving Trojan women are taken as slaves by the victorious Greeks. The epic concludes with the perilous journeys of the Greek leaders on their homeward voyages chronicling the wanderings of Odysseus and the eventual fate of Agamemnon, among others. The Trojan War cycle also extends to the adventures of the next generation, including figures like Orestes and Telemachus, whose stories continue the legacy of the heroic age. On the Trojan side, notable heroes included Aeneas, a valiant warrior and the son of Anchises and the goddess Aphrodite. Aeneas played a crucial role in the defense of Troy and later embarked on a legendary journey that led to the founding of Rome, as chronicled in Virgil's Aeneid. Hector, the eldest son of King Priam and Queen Hecuba, was renowned for his bravery and honor on the battlefield, ultimately meeting his tragic fate at the hands of Achilles. Paris, also known as Alexander, 
instigated the Trojan War by abducting Helen, sparking the conflict between Troy and Greece. Among the Greek forces, notable heroes included Ajax, known as Ajax the Great or Ajax Telamonian, renowned for his immense strength and valor in battle. Achilles, the central figure of the Iliad, was the greatest Greek warrior, known for his prowess in combat and his invulnerability, except for his heel, where he was ultimately struck by an arrow. King Agamemnon, the powerful leader of the Greek expedition, faced numerous challenges and conflicts, including the wrath of Achilles. His brother, King Menelaus of Sparta, was the aggrieved husband of Helen, and a key figure in rallying Greek forces against Troy. Odysseus, famed for his cunning intellect and resourcefulness, played a pivotal role in the Trojan War, particularly in the stratagem of the Trojan horse and in the subsequent events chronicled in Homer's Odyssey. In the late 5th century BC, as Greek society witnessed the rise of philosophy, history, and rationalism, the role of myth underwent a significant transformation. While poets and dramatists continued to rework and reinterpret the traditional myths, Greek historians and philosophers began to subject them to critical scrutiny. The emergence of historical inquiry, exemplified by Thucydides' meticulous documentation of the Peloponnesian War, marked a shift towards a more rationalistic approach to understanding the past. The supernatural elements inherent in traditional mythological genealogies were increasingly questioned and marginalized within the realm of historical discourse. By the 6th century BC, Radical philosophers like Xenophanes of Colophon were openly denouncing the traditional myths as fabrications laden with moral and ethical transgressions attributed to the gods. Xenophanes criticized Homer and Hesiod for portraying the gods engaging in behavior deemed disgraceful among mortals, such as theft, adultery, and deception. Plato, in his philosophical dialogues like the Republic and Laws, took the critique of myth even further. He dismissed the traditional tales as immoral and advocated for the creation of allegorical myths that conveyed deeper philosophical truths. Plato's rejection of the Homeric mythological tradition marked a significant departure from the reverence it once commanded. Aristotle, while acknowledging the cultural significance of myth, also subjected it to scrutiny. He criticized the quasi-mythical philosophical approaches of the pre-Socratic thinkers and emphasized the importance of rational argumentation and evidence-based inquiry over mythological speculation. Despite Plato's efforts to challenge the influence of myth, particularly in his philosophical works, he himself could not fully escape its grasp. In his portrayal of Socrates, Plato relied on traditional Homeric and tragic patterns to extol the virtues of his teacher. Socrates, depicted as valuing principles over personal safety, exemplifies the heroic ideal of risking one's life for the sake of justice and righteousness. Plato's dialogues often incorporate references to traditional myths and epics, demonstrating the enduring hold of mythological narratives on Greek society. Even as Plato critiqued the moral and ethical implications of the traditional myths, he could not entirely divorce himself or his culture from their influence. Hansen and Heath note that Plato's departure from the Homeric tradition was met with resistance among the broader Greek populace. Despite philosophical challenges, the old myths persisted in local cults and continued to shape artistic expressions in poetry, painting, and sculpture. In contrast to Plato's serious engagement with myth, the 5th century BC tragedian Euripides adopted a more playful approach. Euripides often employed irony and skepticism to subvert traditional myths injecting his characters with doubts and questioning the anthropomorphic portrayal of the gods. While Euripides challenged the traditional myths about the gods, his plays remained firmly rooted in mythological themes. However, his reinterpretations often served as responses to earlier versions of the same myths, reflecting an ongoing dialogue within Greek culture about the nature and significance of myth. During the Hellenistic period, mythology underwent a transformation, becoming a mark of elite knowledge that distinguished its possessors as belonging to a certain class. However, this period also saw a deepening of skepticism, building on the critical attitudes that emerged during the Classical Age. One significant figure in this period was the Greek mythographer Euhemerus, who pioneered the approach of seeking historical explanations for mythical beings and events. While Euhemerus' original work, Sacred Scriptures, is lost, 
Its influence is evident in later writings by authors such as Diodorus and Lactantius. Rationalizing interpretations of myth gained popularity during the Roman Empire, particularly influenced by the physicalist theories of Stoic and Epicurean philosophy. Stoics viewed gods and heroes as physical phenomena, while Euhemerists interpreted them as historical figures. Additionally, Stoics and Neoplatonists emphasized the moral dimensions of mythology, often rooted in Greek etymology. The Roman poet and philosopher Lucretius, following the Epicurean tradition, sought to dispel superstitious fears associated with myth. Similarly, Livy expressed skepticism about the mythological tradition, refraining from passing judgment on such legends. Varro, an antiquarian scholar, examined the origins of religious cults, viewing religion as a human institution essential for social order. He proposed that the best approach to understanding mythology was one that combined poetic narratives with philosophical interpretations. However, not all Romans embraced rationalism regarding myth. Academic Cotta ridiculed both literal and allegorical acceptance of myth, arguing that myths had no place in philosophy. Cicero, while generally disdainful of myth, supported the state religion and its institutions, emphasizing the importance of religious tradition and society. The extent of rationalism varied across social strata, with Cicero acknowledging both skepticism and superstition among the populace. His work De Natura Deorum provides a comprehensive summary of his views on mythology and religion, reflecting the complex attitudes of the time towards these traditional narratives. Ancient Greek mythology drew inspiration from a rich tapestry of folkloric portrayals of the Olympian gods, as well as from the diverse traditions of Dorian and Ionian deities and their associated folk tales. In contrast, ancient Roman mythology underwent a significant transformation through the syncretization of various Greek and other foreign gods. With little mythology of their own, the Romans inherited and adapted the Greek mythological tradition, leading to the major Roman gods adopting characteristics of their Greek counterparts. For example, Zeus and Jupiter became intertwined in Roman mythology as a result of this syncretization. Furthermore, the Romans' interactions with Eastern religions facilitated further syncretizations. The cult of the sun, for instance, was introduced in Rome following successful campaigns in Syria resulting in the amalgamation of Asiatic divinities like Mithras and Baal with Apollo and Helios into the deity Sol Invictus. This syncretization extended to religious rites and attributes, reflecting the complexity of Roman religious practice. Despite these developments, the traditional literary mythology became increasingly disconnected from actual religious observance. The worship of Sol as the special protector of the emperors and the empire persisted as the chief imperial religion until the rise of Christianity. Surviving texts from later periods, such as the 2nd century Orphic hymns and the Saturnalia of Macrobius Ambrosius Theodosius from the 5th century, reflect the influence of rationalism and syncretizing trends. The Orphic hymns, attributed to Orpheus but likely composed by various poets, provide insights into prehistoric European mythology. What sets the Orphic hymns apart from other hymns of the time is their mystical and allegorical language, as well as their emphasis on the concept of divine unity and the interconnectedness of the gods with the cosmos and the human soul. They often incorporate Orphic cosmology and theogony, which present a complex worldview involving the origins of the universe, the descent of the soul into the material world, and the quest for spiritual purification and liberation. The Orphic hymns played a significant role in the religious and philosophical thought of the ancient Greeks and later influenced the development of Neoplatonism and other mystical traditions in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. They were also transmitted and adapted by various cultures throughout the Mediterranean region, including the Romans, Egyptians, and Christians. Meanwhile, the Saturnalia serves to transmit Hellenic culture though it incorporates elements of Egyptian and North African mythology and theology as well as mythographical comments influenced by various philosophical schools such as the Euhemerists, Stoics, and Neoplatonists. The study of myth underwent significant advancement in the 19th and 20th centuries, thanks to the development of comparative philology and ethnological discoveries. Since the Romantic era, scholars have approached the study of myth in a comparative manner, seeking to understand its universal themes and motifs. Wilhelm Manhart, James Fraser, 
and Stith Thompson were among the pioneers who employed the comparative approach to collect and classify the themes of folklore and mythology. Their work laid the foundation for the systematic analysis of mythological traditions across different cultures. In 1871, Edward Burnett Tyler published Primitive Culture, applying the comparative method to explain the origin and evolution of religion. Tyler's approach, which integrated material culture, ritual, and myth from diverse cultures, influenced subsequent scholars such as Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. Max Muller further contributed to the study of myth by applying comparative mythology to uncover the remnants of Aryan nature worship in mythological narratives. Bronislav Malinowski emphasized the social functions of myth, highlighting its role in fulfilling common societal needs and functions. Structuralists like Claude Levi Strauss explored the formal relations and patterns in myths across different cultures, revealing underlying structures and symbolic meanings. Their comparative analyses provided deeper insights into the human psyche and the cultural significance of mythological narratives. Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic approach to myth interpretation revolutionized the field by introducing a transhistorical and biological conception of humanity. Freud viewed myth as an expression of repressed ideas, rooted in the unconscious mind. His concept of dream interpretation served as the basis for Freudian myth interpretation, emphasizing the importance of contextual relationships for understanding individual elements within a myth. Freud's ideas offered a significant point of convergence between structuralist and psychoanalytic approaches to myth interpretation. His recognition of the unconscious as a repository of repressed desires and symbols resonated with structuralist notions of underlying patterns and symbolic meanings in mythological narratives. Carl Jung further developed the psychological approach to myth with his theory of the collective unconscious and archetypes. Jung proposed that inherited archaic patterns, encoded in myth, emerge from the collective unconscious. According to Jung, myth-forming structural elements are inherently present in the unconscious psyche, shaping cultural narratives and symbolic representations. Comparing Jung's methodology with Joseph Campbell's theory, scholars like Robert A. Siegel noted distinctions in their approaches. Campbell tended to focus on identifying archetypes and myths and interpreting them within a heroic pattern. In contrast, Jung regarded the identification of archetypes as merely the first step in myth interpretation, emphasizing the deeper psychological and symbolic meanings embedded within myths. Carl Carinii, a prominent figure in Greek mythology studies, embraced Jung's theories of archetypes to reevaluate Greek myths. He departed from his earlier views to apply Jungian concepts, recognizing the presence of archetypal patterns in Greek mythological narratives and their significance in understanding human psychology and culture. Max Muller, a prominent figure in the field of comparative mythology, sought to understand Indo-European religious forms by tracing them back to their hypothetical Indo-European or Aryan origins. In 1891, Miller famously equated Sanskrit Diospata with Greek Zeus, Latin Jupiter, and Old Norse Tyr, highlighting potential linguistic and conceptual connections across Indo-European cultures. However, the question of Greek mythology's place in Indo-European studies has sparked considerable debate and scholarship. George Dumazil, a philologist, drew comparisons between Greek Uranus and Sanskrit Varana suggesting commonalities in character and function without positing an original connection. While some parallels hint at a shared heritage, the lack of linguistic evidence poses challenges in establishing direct links, such as between the Greek Mwari and the Norns of Norse mythology. Although Mycenaean religion likely served as the precursor to Greek religion, Greek mythology exhibits heavy influence from pre-Greek and Near Eastern cultures, complicating attempts to reconstruct Proto-Indo-European religion. Archaeological findings and mythographic studies indicate influences from Asia Minor and the Near East. For instance, Adonis mirrors the archetype of the Near Eastern dying god, while Sibylle's origins lie in Anatolian culture, and Aphrodite's iconography may stem from Semitic goddesses. Moreover, parallels exist between Greek mythology and Near Eastern theogonic concepts, suggesting a cross-cultural exchange of ideas. Some scholars speculate on the contributions of indigenous pre-Greek societies, particularly Crete, Mycenae, Pylos, Thebes, and Orchomenus. Martin P. Nielsen proposes that Minoan gods and religious conceptions fused into the Mycenaean religion, 
anchoring classical Greek myths in prehistoric times. However, Walter Burkert notes a lack of conclusive evidence from the Cretan Palace period to support these theories, highlighting the complexity of unraveling the origins of Greek mythology amidst diverse cultural influences. The advent of Christianity did not diminish the allure of Greek mythology. Instead, with the revival of classical antiquity during the Renaissance, the poetry of Ovid became a significant influence on the artistic and literary imagination. Renowned artists like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael depicted pagan subjects alongside Christian themes showcasing the enduring popularity of Greek mythology in visual arts. In literature, Greek mythology continued to captivate the minds of poets, dramatists, and musicians throughout the Renaissance and beyond. In Italy, the works of Ovid influenced medieval and Renaissance poets such as Petrarch, Boccaccio, and Dante. While in Northern Europe, Greek mythology left a profound impact on literature, from Chaucer and John Milton in England to Racine in France and Goethe in Germany, who revived Greek drama by reworking ancient myths. Although there was a period of enlightenment in the 18th century that saw some reaction against Greek myth, it remained a rich source of inspiration for dramatists. Composers like Handel and Mozart found fertile ground in Greek mythology for their operas, while Romanticism in the late 18th and early 19th centuries sparked a renewed enthusiasm for all things Greek. In Britain, translations of Greek tragedies and Homer inspired poets like Alfred Tennyson, Keats, Byron, and Shelley, as well as painters such as Lord Leighton and Lawrence Almadedema. Musicians like Christoph Gluck, Richard Strauss, and Jacques Offenbach composed works based on Greek mythological themes, contributing to the enduring popularity of these stories in the arts. Even in America, authors like Thomas Bulfinch and Nathaniel Hawthorne emphasized the importance of classical myths in understanding English and American literature. In more recent times, dramatists and novelists across the globe, from Jean Anouilly, Jean Cocteau, and Eugene O'Neill to T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, and André Gide, have continued to reinterpret and reimagine classical themes, ensuring that Greek mythology remains a vital and enduring part of cultural heritage. Greek mythology stands as one of the most renowned and influential bodies of myths in human history. Its impact on literature, storytelling, and culture has been immense, transcending geographical and temporal boundaries to shape the collective imagination of humanity on a global scale. The tales of Greek mythology have inspired countless works of art, literature, and drama throughout the ages. From ancient Greek epic poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey to Renaissance paintings and modern novels, the stories of gods and heroes have captivated the minds of people across generations and continents. Moreover, Greek mythology has permeated popular culture in myriad ways, influencing everything from language and symbolism to philosophy and psychology. Many words and phrases in modern languages have roots in Greek mythological figures and events, while symbols and motifs from these myths continue to appear in literature, film, and advertising. Furthermore, the themes explored in Greek mythology, such as love, betrayal, heroism, and the struggle between gods and mortals, resonate with universal human experiences, making these ancient tales relevant to people of diverse cultures and backgrounds. In essence, Greek mythology's enduring legacy serves as a testament to its enduring power and significance in shaping the cultural landscape of the world. Its timeless stories continue to fascinate and inspire, reminding us of the rich tapestry of human imagination and creativity that transcends borders and spans the ages.